Hello everyone, this video is on deep reinforcement learning of walking robots. By the end of this video, you will see how this simulation of a bipedal robot was trained to walk using reinforcement learning, specifically deep reinforcement learning, which uses neural networks. If you want to know more about how this walking robot model was created, check out our other walking robot videos, which will be linked in the description below. So let's introduce the problem. In this example, the simulation of the walking robot is what we define as the environment. So this is the physical system that we're trying to, in some way, control to teach this robot how to walk. Uh, reinforcement learning comes in in the form of an agent. You can think of this as a controller. So what's happening is that the environment is producing some kind of state or observation, which was then passed through the agent and it generates an action. For our example, the state is a set of values that we've chosen. And for us, it's going to consist of the translation and rotation of the robot body, the joint angles of each leg and all their derivatives, as well as an indicator of the normal force on the left and right feet to tell you whether or not that foot is in contact with the ground. With those measurements, the agent will then produce an action, which we've chosen to be the torques applied at each of the joints of the robot's legs. So this happens as a continuous feedback system, and at each time step, the environment will generate some kind of reward function. This is something that we get to choose as designers, but it should indicate how well this robot is able to walk, and we'll talk more about that soon. So the way reinforcement learning comes in is that you now use past experiences. So you're going to keep simulating and you're going to be collecting a set of states, actions, and rewards that you will use to train your agent to further maximize that reward, which means if done correctly, that the robot will learn how to walk. Let's dig into a bit more detail as to how this is done. First of all, we're using reinforcement learning toolbox, which contains a set of agents or algorithms that can do different kinds of reinforcement learning problems. For example, if the system contains discrete states, discrete actions, or continuous versions of those. In our case, we're choosing Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, or DDPG, because it's one of the algorithms in reinforcement learning that can handle a continuous action space. By that, I mean that the joint torques that we're applying can actually take any continuous value between the minimum and maximum value that we prescribe. I won't get into the theory of this, and I'd like to point you to the reinforcement learning tech talks on our page if you want to know more information, but I'll talk about it a little bit. DDPG, first of all, consists of one deep neural network known as the actor, which will effectively act as your controller for the system, right? You're going to accept the state and output an action. So this is what's eventually going to be driving this robot to walk. But that's not enough to actually train uh, the entire agent. There's actually a second neural network known as the critic, and that accepts both the state and the action and outputs an estimated value. This particular value we refer to as the Q function, which you can roughly think of as the expected reward you're going to get if you start at a particular state and you take a particular action. So you wanna train the critic to correctly estimate how well you're gonna walk from any given state, given a decision. Now, as you're collecting data, so you're running the simulation, performing trial and error, you are collecting the actual measured reward that you observed. And by comparing the estimate and the measurement, you get a loss function or an error measurement, which you can then use to back propagate and train the networks like you would with any other neural network. So let's switch to MATLAB to see how we did this. Okay, so I'll start by opening the Simulink model that we're going to use to do this reinforcement learning. As you see, first we have our model of the walking robot, which is going to act as the environment for the system. And that contains all the Simscape multibody blocks that do the 3D simulation for the mechanics of the robot. At the very center, highlighted in red there, is the RL agent block. And this is just a built-in block in the reinforcement learning toolbox that allows you to refer to a reinforcement learning agent that will exist as an object in our MATLAB workspace. We'll get into what that's made of in just a second. Now, regardless of the agent that you're using, this is going to accept three things. The observation or the state, the reward, and a flag or a signal on whether the simulation is done. In our case, we're defining this termination criteria based on things like, did the robot fall? Or did it deviate too far away from the straight line path that we wanted it to follow? Uh, I do want to point out one thing, is that even though we're showing this as a Simulink example, Reinforcement Learning Toolbox agents can also plug into MATLAB classes. So you could do this all with a MATLAB-based environment simulation as well. And that lets you interface to other languages as well if you want. I want to focus a bit more on the reward function. Uh, and I want to do this because this is a very important thing to get right if you want your reinforcement learning problem to uh, improve or converge. 
So I'll run through the reward signal, and you see that this is inspired by the literature. So what does it mean for us to walk well? Well, you saw in the video that this robot is going to walk in a straight line forward. So the first thing we'll do is we'll add a reward, or we'll reward velocity in the forward x direction, which means moving forward in a straight line. But that's not enough. You also need to make sure the robot doesn't deviate too far from the line or fall down, which means that we're going to apply a penalty on the y and z dimension displacement to make sure that that robot is on track. Uh, besides that, another thing that we had to do was to put some penalty on the joint effort or the joint torques that we're applying. And the reason is that if we don't penalize this, then you could get some aggressive motions that, sure, they will make the robot move quickly, but may not yield very realistic physical results. The, the last part in the reward is actually what I call a duration reward, or you can think of it as a survival reward. And this is preventing a very common local minimum here where the robot very early on learns to fall forward and you know immediately maximize its forward movement reward. But we needed to get around that by adding some kind of you know reward boost for actually surviving longer without falling. So this is our final reward function. And you can change this, and it will significantly change the results of your reinforcement learning. So going back to the top model, I promised that I would talk about this reinforcement learning agent. So let's go back to MATLAB, and I will open up one of our scripts called Create DDPG Networks. Here, I'm using Deep Learning Toolbox to define a neural network that contains you know, all the parameters for expressing the actor and the critic. So you see here, I'm defining the critic as basically arrays of different layers from the deep learning toolbox. And the same thing for the actor if I scroll down. And you might recognize certain layers like fully connected or ReLU, which is rectified linear units. So you can define this all by code. However, you can also do this graphically using the deep network designer. So let me go ahead and run this script. And then under my apps, I will open the deep network designer. Once I have this defined, I can import one of the existing networks. So for instance, let me import the actor network first. As you can see here, the actor network is fairly simple. It accepts the observation, and then it goes through uh, three fully connected layers. So really two hidden layers, and then one that is going to be the output layer. And because it's the action, we want that to be bounded between the minimum and maximum torque. So we are putting that against a hyperbolic tangent or tanched layer. And then you can see all these parameters here, like the weight, the dimensions of the weights, rather, and other learning parameters that you can change. And of course, I could modify this network by copy-pasting or moving things around, connecting and disconnecting. But this is what they look like right now. Similarly, I'm going to import the critic network. This one is a little bit more complicated. And the reason being is that, remember, the critic network accepts both the observation and the action. So we have two separate branches and then we're adding them together to produce our final output. Remember, for the critic, that output is just going to be a single value representing that Q function that we defined. You also notice that the, the observation branch is longer than the action branch, and that's only because the observation is higher dimensional. So we want to put that through more computation and add more nonlinearity before we concatenate that with the action. So once we have these networks, at the very end, we actually create what is known as a RL, a reinforcement learning representation, where we take that network, as well as information about how this is going to map to our environment or our Simulink model, and that will give us an agent that we can finally train. If I go to our options script, you'll see that these contain quite a bit of hyperparameters for training. Specifically, there are the agent options and the training options. For the agent options, this is going to define common things for your agent, such as the discount factor for your reward, the batch size that you're going to use for training in, on you know, batches of experiences, as well as things like the, the target update method for updating the off-policy target network, and adding noise to the action space so you can actually explore different paths instead of just exploiting what you've learned. On the training option, this also defines things like how long you're going to run training? When should you stop training? So here we define things like the maximum total episodes we're going to use, the maximum number of simulation steps for each episode or simulation, how to do moving averages of scores, how to define termination criteria, saving criteria, and whether we want to use things like parallel computing to speed up our training. 
So with all of this, again, we can set up our environment by hooking this into our Simulink model, create our networks, create our training options, and finally perform some training. So as you see in the animation for the robot simulation and the plots on the right, training is now taking place. This can take a long time, so I will talk through a bit of the initial process here. You'll see that there are three curves in this Reinforcement Learning Episode Manager. The blue curve is going to show you the reward that you get for every episode or every simulation, whereas the red reward is just a moving average. And moving average is good because reinforcement learning uh, rewards can get very noisy, as especially as you explore a pretty aggressive exploration strategy, and you want to follow the overall trends of where the rewards are going. In fact, we're terminating this uh, optimization based on the average reward and not the instantaneous one. The last thing is the, the green line, which is labeled here as episode Q0, and that defines the initial value or Q function that the critic is estimating based on our initial condition. So, you know, as the critic network is trained, that this is going to give a more accurate estimate of what, what it thinks that the reward is going to be for the duration of that simulation. Now, this will take a while to run, as I said. So I'm going to stop this and I'll show you one that is pre-trained and it has done so using parallel computing, um, which allows you to basically farm out these simulations to multiple cores or even multiple computers so that you can train more quickly. The other thing that I want to mention is that for the training of the neural networks themselves, uh, you can take advantage of any NVIDIA GPUs that you might have installed on your computer. And we're doing this here, but our network right now, as you saw, is pretty simple. It doesn't have many hidden layers, but as you start bringing in other things like image data or more complicated input signals, then GPUs are really going to help you speed up training of this reinforcement learning agent. So now we'll show you one of the plots that we recreated from one of the pre-saved agents. So here's the full episode training plot. You see that this ran for 3,500 episodes. That's quite a bit of simulation steps. And initially, you know, for the first third, at least, of the episodes, they were pretty short and you didn't generate much reward. Suddenly something happened where the reinforcement learning algorithm was able to explore out of some local minimum, and then your reward became much higher until it trended upwards to the point that the training terminated. You'll see that the blue lines or the individual episode rewards are still very noisy, but there is a general upwards trend with a lot of noise for that moving average reward in red. One thing you'll notice is that DDPG is a what's known as a high variance algorithm. And this means that the reward isn't really guaranteed to just keep increasing monotonically, and you should look out for this. In addition to terminating at a particular average reward, you really should have some kind of save criteria for extracting agents that have performed very well or gotten a high enough reward, and then you can test them later. So in our case, we actually drew a cutoff at around 150 reward, and you see that gives you a lot of different peaks of individual agents that you can try. And what I'm about to show you is one of those pre-saved agents. Another thing I want to highlight is there's, here's the plot of the average number of time steps that the simulation was able to survive. And you see that that average number also goes up, meaning that the robot is much less likely to fall, uh, 400 here being the maximum. So having done that, let's go to our simulation. If I play this simulation, and I'm going to show you the joint torques that were generated also, this robot's able to walk pretty stably. It doesn't look quite as we'd expect from a physical system, but it's good enough and it certainly meets the reward requirements. So this is one example of a successful, uh, successfully trained reinforcement learning agent. So we covered a lot in this video and I'm gonna wrap this up with some key takeaways. First of all, we showed that reinforcement learning can solve some pretty complicated controls problems. Although you should really think about whether reinforcement learning is the right choice or you want to use some kind of analytical control strategy that is well established or combine them both in some optimal way. We also specifically saw deep reinforcement learning, which was the use of neural networks as function approximators to handle state spaces or action spaces that are either really high dimensional or infinite in the case of the continuous system. I can't stress this one enough. Choosing good states, actions, and reward functions is very important. We talked about reward functions when we ran through the model, but states and actions are all important as well. For example, there's kind of an unwritten best practice that your states and actions should be also around the range plus or minus one with a mean close to zero, 
because otherwise your neural network parameters or training parameters may not work quite as well for your problems. So if you have information about the system, you should certainly use that to try scale all these signals. The other thing we saw is that reinforcement learning can take a lot of time because it requires a lot of simulation data. I used a computer to do this task that had uh, six computation cores and some good GPUs. And for one of these typical problems, it could take me about half a day to complete this, which is pretty typical for reinforcement learning tasks. And finally, we used the Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, or DDPG algorithm. This is a high variance algorithm, and you saw that the reward really was oscillating significantly. So you should really run these trainings several times and try to pick different trained agents and see which one works best, and you can refine from there. So as always, thank you for watching, and make sure to check out our other resources linked here. Thank you.